当开，到，门阿平路当开。Pinunod ba? Ta. Dadala. Ta. Baba. Ta. Your Holiness, the ceremony is now over. Ang opinion mo, Baba? Ba!
Vatican Radio, English Channel. Vatican Radio, English Channel.
Good to see you there, Mike.
Okay, thank you. Certainly the idea of missionary discipleship is a big theme of the Pope's pontificate. And as we're speaking, the Holy Father has now arrived in the ceremonial hall, the Rizal ceremonial hall, uh, greeted by the diplomats, who are all on their feet, of course, and accompanied by the president. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, His Holiness, Pope Francis, and His Excellency, Benigno S. Aquino III, President, Republic of the Philippines. Both Sri Lanka and the Philippines are home to literally dozens of native languages. And for that reason, the language of uh, these visits on the part of the Pope has largely been English as a kind of neutral language. And also a language that is going to be recognized by very, very many people, uh, both in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. In fact, in the Philippines, English is one of the official languages. And so we've had the great honor and privilege of being able to hear our Holy Father speaking in English for the better part of this trip. And as everybody gets themselves adjusted, we wait to hear in just a few moments from the President of the Philippines. And gentlemen, His Excellency Benigno S. Aquino III, President, Republic of the Philippines. Your Holiness, distinguished guests. Colonialism was brought to our shores partly by the efforts of the conquistadores and partly through the efforts of the church. When the clergy in that period was asked how they justified the injustices committed during the colonization of the Philippines, they responded by saying the kingdom of God is not of this earth. With Vatican II, however, this changed. Instead of being a pillar of the establishment, the church began to question the status quo. My understanding of the changes inspired by Vatican II and of the influence of liberation theology was the notion that temporal matters affect our spiritual well-being and consequently cannot be ignored. Two passages from scripture come to mind. The first comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40, in which a Pharisee posed this question to Jesus Christ. And I quote, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Close quote. The clear link between the two greatest commandments, as Christ put it, is further emphasized in another passage. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 36, Christ said, and again I quote, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Close quote. The gospel challenges each member of the church to go beyond alms giving and mere charity, and to be concerned with injustice in, in in temporal matters, we were further taught that if we do not intercede to make each person capable of exercising true freedom of choice, then we are not our brother's keepers. One of the examples given to us involved a certain question. If it is a sin to steal, who is the greatest sinner? The desperate man in an impossible situation forced to steal to feed his starving family, or the politician with an insatiable greed who, despite not having real material needs, stole from the public coffers. When the, church engaged, when the church engaged in temporal matters, it was truly working to bring the kingdom of God apparent in this world. It was a living church, a source of nurturing and support for the faithful. At a time when movies like The Cardinal, The Shoes of the Fisherman, and even Jesus Christ Superstar elicited deeper thoughts on how to further deepen the faith. 
These teachings have been central to my family's advocacy, which is understandable considering what we, along with millions of Filipinos, went through under the dictatorship. Then President Marcos declared martial law in 1972, when I was 12 years old, beginning an era in which the most fundamental rights of many Filipinos were flagrantly and routinely violated. It was in this environment that I came of age. In a sense, I had the front row seat to, the, to that tyranny and persecution. After all, the dictator. Dictator's most secure prison had the courage to speak the truth about Mr. Marcos's abuses, even as he was being vindicated. Many others in the church, such as Jaime Cardinal Sin, Bishop Francisco Claver, and Bishop Antonio Fortich, to name just a few, truly, truly lived, lived their, faith their faith and acted as followers of Christ in being their brother's keepers. The courage and daring displayed by the clergy solidified my belief, especially during the martial law years. The church of the poor and the oppressed shone vividly. The clergy was always at the forefront of those wanting to emulate Christ and carry the burdens for all of us. Indeed, they nourished the compassion, faith, and courage of the Filipino people. This allowed millions to come together as a single community of faith and make possible the miracle of the EDSA People Power Revolution. Perhaps we had grown so accustomed to having this church, always at the forefront of championing the rights of all, especially those of the marginalized, that we found it hard to understand its transformation. We were taught that the Catholic Church is the true church and that there is constancy, for it upholds the truth at all times. Hence, there was a true test of faith when many members of the church, once advocates for the poor, the marginalized and the helpless, suddenly became silent in the face of the previous administration's abuses, which we are still trying to rectify to this very day. In these attempts at correcting the wrongs of the past, one would think that the church would be our natural ally. In contrast to their previous silence, some members of the clergy now seem to think that the way to be true to the faith means finding something to criticize, even to the extent that one prayerly admonished me to do something about my hair, as if it were a mortal sin. Is it any wonder then that they see the glass not as half full or half empty, but almost totally empty? Judgment is rendered, is rendered without, without an appreciation of the facts. I understand I am only human, and thus I am imperfect. I ran for the presidency despite my discomfort with the trappings of power, because if I passed up on this opportunity to effect real change, I would not have been able to live with myself, especially if the situation worsened. But in this effort, the participation of all is necessary. Everything, Everything I, have I have said has not been to criticize, but to speak the truth, for the truth shall set us all free. If we are able to settle our differences, can we not benefit our people quicker? This is why I was struck by what Your Holiness recently said to the Curia, when you warned them of the illnesses that not only Christians, but anyone in a position of power is prone to, including that of thinking one's self immortal or indispensable, and the danger of becoming sowers of discord through gossip and grumbling. I appreciate and respect Your Holiness for your role as a unifying and revitalizing voice. Not just among Catholics, but also among all peoples of goodwill. Your statements bear witness to the compassion and understanding of Christ. Exhibiting the same humility, you eschew the trappings of your position, even to the necessary security preparations, which I should admit has been somewhat of a security nightmare for us. In all seriousness, who can deny that Your Holiness is truly living the life of one who is dedicated to advocating for the oppressed and marginalized. I believe that you are a kindred spirit, one who sings, sees things as they are and is afraid, or rather unafraid, of asking, why not? Some of your statements might have been shocking or offensive to some peers, but your holiness is meant to be the instrument through which the kingdom of God is allowed to flourish. In your example, we see the wisdom of continuing to ask, why not? We see joy, a sense of authentic service, and an insistence on a true community of the faithful. We thank the Lord for other kindred spirits like Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle, 
Father Catalino Arevalo and Sister Agnes Guillen, who have always been voices of reason and who are spiritual people who will always be natural allies, along with so many others. We would like to think that even more will join us in the truth in the fullness of time. In the fight to transform society, one cannot help but be heartened by the fact that we are not alone. When we tread this path with people such as yourself, along with the millions you have inspired, we gain the courage to do what needs doing, the optimism to dream about what we can achieve in unity with one another, and the opportunity to turn that dream into a shared reality with the grace of Almighty God. The Filipino people in whose name I welcome you today ask your blessing. May we find more mercy and compassion in our lives. Thank you. Good day. Certainly Thank a you, very interesting speech on the part of the President, Benigno Aquino III. Excellencies, and now the words of our Holy Father. His Holiness, Pope Francis. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you, Mr. President, for your kind welcome and for your words of greeting in the name of the authorities and the people of the Philippines and the distinguished members of the diplomatic corps. I'm most grateful for your invitation to visit Philippines. My visit is, above all, pastoral. It comes and the church in this country is preparing to celebrate the fifth centenary of the first proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ on these shores. The Christian message has had an immense influence on Filipino culture. It is my hope that this important anniversary will point to its continuing fruitfulness and its potential to inspire a society worthy of the goodness, dignity, and aspirations of the Filipino people. In a particular way, this visit is meant to express my closeness to our brothers and sisters who endured and suffering loss and devastation caused by Typhoon Yolanda. Together with many people throughout the world, I have admired the heroic strength, faith, and resilience demonstrated by so many Filipinos in the face of the natural disaster and so many others. The search was rooted not least in the hope and solidarity instilled by Christian faith, gave rise to an outpouring of goodness and generosity, especially on the part of so many of the young. In that moment of national crisis, countless people came to aid of their neighbors in need. At great sacrifice, they have on their time and resources, creating networks of mutual help and working for the common good. This example of solidarity in the work of rebuilding, teach us an important lesson. Like a family, every society draws of the deepest resources in order to face new challenges. Today, the Philippines, together with many other countries of Asia, face the challenge of building on solid foundations 
a modern society. A society that is respectful to authentic human values, protective of all good given human dignity and rights, and ready to confront new and complex political and ethical questions. As many voices in your nation have pointed out, it is now more than ever necessary that political leaders be outstanding for the honesty, integrity, and commitment to the common good. In this way, they will help preserve the rich human and natural resources with which God has blessed this country. Thus, will they be able to marshal the moral resources needed to face the demands of the present and to pass on to coming generations a society of authentic justice, solidarity, and peace. Essential to the attainment of these national goals is the moral imperative of ensuring social justice and respect for human dignity. The great biblical tradition enjoins on all peoples the duty to hear the voice of the poor. It bid us break the bonds of injustice and oppression, which give rise to glaring at indeed the scandal of social inequalities. Reforming the social structures which perpetuate poverty and the exclusion of the poor first require a conversion of men and heart. The bishops of the Philippines have asked that this year be set aside as the year of the poor. I hope that these prophetic psalms will challenge everyone at all levels of society to reject every form of corruption which diverts resources from the poor. May it also inspire concern and force to ensure the inclusion of every man and human and children in the life of the community. A fundamental role in the renewal of society is played, of course, by the family, and especially by young people. A highlight of my visit will be my meetings with families and with young people here in Manila. Families have an indispensable mission in society. It is in, in the family that children are trained in sound values, high ideals, and genuine concern for others. But like all God's gifts, the family can also be disfigured and destroyed. It needs our support. We know how difficult it is for all democracies today to preserve and defend such basic human values as respect for the inviolable dignity of each human person, respect for our rights of conscience and religious freedom, and respect for the inalienable right to life, beginning with that of the unborn and extending to that of the elderly and infirm. For this reason, families and local communities might be encouraged and assisted in their efforts to transmit to our young the values and the vision which can help bring about a culture of integrity. A culture which honors goodness, truthfulness, 
fidelity and solidarity as the form of foundation, as the moral glue which holds society together. Mr. President, distinguished authorities, dear friends, as I begin my visit to this country, I cannot fail to mention the Philippines' important role in fostering understanding and cooperation among the countries of Asia. I would also mention the oft neglected yet real contribution of Filipinos of the diaspora to the life and welfare, welfare of, the, of society the society in which, in which they, they live. It is precisely in the light of the rich and cultural and religious heritage of which your country is bound that I leave you with a challenge and a word of prayerful encouragement. May the deepest spiritual values of the Filipino people continue to find inspiration in your efforts to provide your fellow citizens with an integral human development. In this way, each person will be able to fulfill his or her potential and thus contribute wisely and well to the future of this country. I am confident that the praiseworthy efforts to promote the dialogue and cooperation within the followers of different religions will prove fruitful in the pursuit of this known goal. In a particular way, I express my trust that the progress made in bringing peace to the south of the country will result in just solution in accord with the nation's founding principles and respectful of inalienable rights of all, including the indigenous people and religious minorities. Upon all of you and upon all the men and women and children of the beloved nation, I cordially invoke God's abundance, blessings. Thank you. And that was Pope Francis addressing the assembled civil authorities and the members of the diplomatic corps in the Philippines, speaking at Malacanang Palace, the presidential palace. And that was, in fact, the Pope's first major address in the Philippines. As we speak, there's the opportunity for the photographs with the president. And the Holy Father uh, will, of course, be greeting a few more people as he uh, proceeds out of the palace. And a number of the uh, people will have an opportunity to greet him as he passes by. As usual, the Holy Father uh, always enjoys the opportunity to meet with people. It is remarkable in the circumstances, the closeness that people are able to, to approach the Holy Father. And to see a world figure like the Pope surrounded by so many people uh, pressing close to him is is quite remarkable indeed.
with a relatively short visit, the Pope is packing in as many events as possible. And so he is being hurried away to the Cathedral of Milan, dedicated to Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. And reading the elderly at this moment. Again, one of the most remarkable features, I think, of all of the Pope's events are the opportunities he takes to meet with and visit with people. And one can really see on his face uh, how important it is for him to be able to speak with the very young, with the very old, with those who are sick or suffering in any way. And that really is one of the Amen. And very briefly, they brought the Holy Father back to the, the podium to offer a blessing. Please remain in your places until His Holiness and the President have left the hall. Thank you. So we brought the Holy Father back to the podium to offer a blessing over all of those assembled here. He will be traveling uh, very shortly. And it must be said on schedule to the cathedral in Milan dedicated to Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. The cathedral is considered the mother of all of the churches in the Philippines. minute ride to the cathedral. The cathedral, the actual church that stands there now is actually the eighth version of a church that was originally built in 1581, more than 400 years ago. And the original church was made of bamboo and palm leaves. As the Holy Father leaves, he is once again saluted by an honor guard. And led by the president. Who greets him one last time as he leads him to the papal motorcade. interpreters close in hand and translators and protocol officers close at hand to uh, translate the last exchange between the president and the Holy Father, Pope Francis, uh, joined by Cardinal Tagle, gets into the open air Pope mobile. And it takes a few moments as everybody gets themselves settled to wave to the crowds and and greet uh, one last time all those who have gathered at the presidential palace. Allow people to get a few more photographs in. And with that, the Holy Father departs from the Presidential Palace uh, and will undertake the brief journey to the Cathedral in Manila. With that, we're going to sign off for a few minutes until the Pope's arrival for Mass. Once again, my name is Christopher Wells. I'd like to greet all of those listening in around the world 
on EWTN TV, Radio Luce, Radio Maria Polonia, Radio Renaissance, We Are One Body Radio, Catholic TV, Net TV, Salt and Light TV, Telecare TV, Radio Maria Philippines, and Shalom World TV. Thank you for joining us for the Pope's Voyage and for the address to the civil authorities. Be sure to join us again in about 15 minutes for the Holy Father's Mass for bishops, priests, religious, and seminarians in the Cathedral of Minoa, beginning in about 12 minutes. Laudetur Jesus Christus.